Cincinnati Bengals linebackers Jermaine Pratt and Logan Wilson weren't quite as good in 2023 as they were the year prior. Let's get into why and what the outlook should be for the future. You are Locked On Bengals, your daily Cincinnati Bengals podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Bengals fans, and welcome to another episode of the Locked On Bengals podcast. I'm your host, Jake Lisko, along with your host, James Rapine, today joined by Mike Santagata, who wrote up the Bengals linebackers at allbengals.com to talk about the Bengals starting linebackers, Jermaine Pratt and Logan Wilson. Today's episode brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. Right now, you'll get $200 in bonus bets if your $5 bet or more wins at fanduel.com slash locked on and if you're new to the show you can find us on youtube or anywhere you get your podcasts and hit the subscribe button to join the legion calling them a legion today for some reason of bengals fans who make us their first listen and our everydayers and guys we're going to talk linebackers today very exciting topic a couple of guys that were expected to continue a high level of play and when things changed around them did not sustain that level of play yeah, I think it's it's interesting because you could certainly you could say that in the the transition and, and we'll talk about that with Mike in a second. But I think the casual fan that's just watching and maybe not even listening to this podcast, but just watching is like, oh, those guys got paid and now they're not they're not as physical. They're, they're not as willing to, ta- to tackle. So I, it, it is interesting. And I'm not saying that's the case, but I do think that there are some that do that with any player that gets paid. Heck, people look at Joe Burrow differently. Not that that's right, because it's not. Uh, but Jermaine Pratt and Logan Wilson both signing contract extensions, and yet their play did dip some this season. Mike, let's start there. When you looked at these guys and, and you watched every snap, and you think back to the 2021 season, the 2022 season, just overall, was it a significant dip? Is it a big reason why this defense felt different this year to last year or the year prior? I think it was significant. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I thought they were both good players, like individually good to, I mean, at times really good players last year. And there's, it's tough to point to too many games that it felt like that this year where the linebackers had really good games, especially both of them at the same time, like individually once in a while, they'd have a good, like the Colts game was a pretty good game from Pratt. But Wilson got dunked on by Moali Cox, and it's like, well, did the linebackers play good or did one of them play good? But, uh, yeah, they weren't consistent enough or good enough to be close to what they were last year to me. So let's talk about why, Mike, and whether it was the same thing for both players, whether it was the same deficiencies around them, same deficiencies for the individual players, same issues in the secondary, because – one thing that Lou Anarumo talked about was that with the change in safety, a lot more communication responsibility fell on the linebackers. Was that a significant a part of things as Lou made it sound? Yeah, absolutely. And I think there's a lot of examples of a linebacker giving the universal signal of I'm passing this off pointing <laughs> and nobody taking that guy. So you would see plays where Logan Wilson, this is just one example uh, I think it was Jordan Addison is running a deep over route and they're running a fire zone three deep Logan Wilson points. Now I'm not hundred percent sure if it's supposed to be DJ Turner or Dax Hill that's supposed to take him in this. I could see the argument for either one, but he points. He's like, I'm not taking this guy. Like this is, I'm passing him off to somebody back here and nobody matches him. And he's 20 yards downfield without a guy within 10 yards around him. He's able to just sit down, catch the ball. And that's an explosive play, right? Like the Bengals at times are struggling for 20 yard, 20 air yards on a play. And this happened just because they can't communicate. And it was almost once a game, at least where there was a play where point and nobody listened, nobody saw, nobody changed, nobody carried him. It would just be the same thing over and over. And that was really frustrating because it was happening late in the season too. So what do you do about that? Is that a linebacker issue? Is that a safety issue? How do you address that? Because there should be continuity, at least with those guys year over year. There should be experience related growth from those guys in the secondary. Are, are your thoughts that that should be something that improves? Is that something that you can trace to coaching? Where, where do you pinpoint that? 
I would say it naturally improves. Uh, they need the continuity to get to know each other better. They need the continuity to be able to communicate better. But really, I think it's less about blaming one person and just kind of going to both like, hey, you guys need to communicate. I know you're pointing, but maybe you need to yell or yell louder or whatever. And the other side of it is Dax Hill or it felt like the young guys. It felt like there were times with Storm Battle, Dax Hill, or DJ Turner. It didn't feel so much like it was Mike Hilton or Chidobe Uzie. It felt like those guys, they were able to work together, but not so much. And Scott, too. But uh, new to this team, I think everybody had issues with this communication. And to me, that should get better with continuity. I think that's just something that takes time to build. It didn't build fast enough for the defense to perform at an adequate level this year. But I think year over year, like, going into next season if the secondary is the same with these young guys it should be better i also think cam taylor Britt and them communicate fine so that's just one year in the system and they were able to pass things off to each other so communication wise hopefully that's fixable uh the other element and, and we can talk about each guy individually coming up i think and in, in dive in to, to a bit more detail but defensive line wise since we're discussing the things around them that have changed how much was of it was the fact that outside of DJ Reader and BJ Hill, they and even when those guys were out there together, it, it, it's not like they were the best run defense in the league and they struggled at times. And the, the, these linebackers weren't able to roam because they had offensive linemen in their face regularly. Yeah, uh, there's something I don't know if everybody really cares that much about or watches, but keeping your linebackers clean is such an important job of the defensive line. You can trace this. Uh, what I trace it back to is Rex Ryan once saying like, yeah, Ray Lewis is incredible, but Syracuse and the guys in front of him, they're the reason he's incredible because he gets to just run around and hit people instead of having to deal with offensive linemen. And that was true for the linebackers last year. And it felt like the year before they were able to just run around, hit people in the run game. They didn't have to deal with shedding blocks very often. This year they had to shed more blocks than usual and they kind of struggled for it. And even if they could shed the block, you're making the tackle harder. So I think that also contributes into both of them having more missed tackles this year than last year and a worse missed tackle percentage this year than last year. The defensive line, I thought DJ Rio did a really good job keeping them clean and BJ Hill did a pretty good job. And then Anybody else that stepped in did the worst job imaginable about keeping them clean. They were either either driven back into them or they just let the guy go get a kill shot on the linebacker. It's, you know, you got to you got to keep them. You got to do something there to at least slow them down so that they can get into their spot or they can outrun that guy. I mean, think of the Bengals offensive line. If they're not if the Bengals offensive line isn't going to clean shot to the linebackers, are they getting there? Like, probably not. You have to be a really good athlete. <laughs> not, a, not a ton of offensive linemen are. So, yeah, I, I think the defensive line played a big part in it. And I think it even bleeds into the pass game, too, because on play action, they probably feel like we have to come up harder. Mm -hmm. We have to come downhill a little bit because if I stay back here, I'm getting picked off or I have to go over a block or try to figure out a run through underneath. So I'm going to take more steps forward and then have to robot or roll over or whatever, or even just drop, just speed drop back into a window, whatever coverage they're playing. So I, I felt like it bled into both areas and yeah, they're kind of like the, the middle part of the Oreo here and both parts around them kind of failed them and they were worse for the. Where? What's, what's the big difference on the D line. I know we're going to talk about linebackers. This will be a linebacker episode. I promise. We'll talk about the individual players coming up in just a minute, but it's the same personnel. DJ reader just got hurt. But even when DJ reader was on the field this year, the run D was worse. So is there something that you could isolate you know, in, in 30 seconds or less that, that would explain that difference from 22 to 23? Yeah, I think one of the big ones is Tupo kind of regressed. And I thought he did a pretty good – he thought he did a solid job the last couple of years. And then this year happened, and it didn't feel like it anymore. It felt like the game kind of moved a little too quick for him or he was on skates a little bit at times. So when they used to be able to – because in their base downs, so they're in their three interior defensive linemen front. So even if you have Reed or Hill, there's somebody else there. And yeah. whether it was Tupo or Carter, whoever, they didn't seem to do a very good job. On it was also things. more Carter than Tupo. Yeah, it was the, also the, more Carter the, this year. The snap workload changed a little bit between those two guys. But like I said, we'll talk about these linebackers individually because there are differences. They are not the same player. They are a unit, but there are differences. We'll continue that conversation with Mike coming up next.
Today's show is brought to you by eBay Motors. Passion, drive, and patience. What brings home the winning trophy is also what helps keep your ride or die alive. And eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance from superchargers, roof racks, ex exhaust kits, LED headlights. They have everything but the defensive tackles that are going to keep your linebackers clean. So whether you're into speed, power, style, eBay Motors has got you covered. And with over 122 million bar parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride or die every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need and the prices you want, it's easy to turn your car into the MVP and bring home that win. Keep, on, keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. That's ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply eBay guaranteed fit only available to U.S. customers. James, which linebacker would you like to start with? I will give you the honors. Jermaine uh, Pratt, Logan Wilson. Simple. The guy who makes more money. Logan Wilson signed a, a bigger extension. We'll, uh, we'll start there. And I know playoff P. Jermaine Pratt's your guy, Sands, but he's going to have to wait a second. Uh, to me, and you mentioned him getting dunked on by Mo Ali cox that stood out to me. I know he still had the four interceptions this year and still had some good plays in coverage. But when I think of Logan Wilson, I think of a guy who can stick with receivers if you need him to at times, certainly with tight ends if you need him to at times. How did he do in coverage overall when you went back and watched him on film? I was disappointed, and I was disappointed in both of them. But since we're starting with Wilson, you brought the four interceptions and um, – to stick with one more statistical thing I saw, yeah. despite having three more interceptions than last year, he still gave up a higher passer rating when targeted. And I mean, wow. the yards per target was eight wow. instead of 6.6. .6. So he was getting picked on a little bit despite those interceptions. I, I felt like there were just times where he could get moved by good quarterbacks. He took the cheese a little bit, like individually, not even talking about like all the issues with the communication and everything around him. But once in a while, he would take the cheese too on like uh, the linebackers. I feel like 90% of the time, what you're dealing with is a guy sitting down in front of you and somebody trying to run behind you when you go up to, you know, high lows, high lows are the middle of the field. That's huge of them. And he would take the cheese sometimes and just kind of run down and ball goes behind him and there's a 10 yard gain and he's running. So, I thought that happened a little bit more this year. I thought he got moved a little bit more this year. I thought he just didn't always make the play on the ball. And I don't mean interceptions because he made interceptions, but he did break up nine passes. It's impressive. But I also feel like there were plays that he had an opportunity to do that. You could think of the Mo Cox play. I mean, one of those passes defense was an underthrow that hit him in the helmet when he didn't know where it was. So how much credit do you get for that? <laughs> so I, I feel like, he still made really impressive plays. I think maybe the most impressive play I've seen from him, maybe, maybe not, but he opens up one way against Matt Stafford on Tampa two, and then he flips his hips completely, finds the crosser, gets underneath it, and gets an interception. That was awesome. That was awesome. Was, that was one of the yeah. best plays he's ever made. But those plays didn't outweigh the other plays where I felt like he didn't do the best job individually in coverage. Is there something you could – talk about as to why you think that changed for him this year because it's not like he's hit an age ball he's 27 and a half years old or so as of the day of recording he's in the middle of his prime just got his second contract what what would you attribute some of these differences to I already talked a little bit about how I think the defensive line made them kind of have to react a little bit harder to run past I also feel like he probably didn't feel as confident in the coverage because of everything around him. So maybe he felt like he had to do a little bit more. Maybe he felt like maybe that's why you jump the bait in a, in a high low is okay. We've been giving up explosive plays left and right. Like if, if this is thrown underneath and Hey, all these guys are missing tackles too. I'll make that tackle. Even though he did, he still had a pretty solid this tackle percentage, even if it was worse than last year. No, he, Maybe you're pressing. Maybe it's just when things start going wrong, you can't build up the confidence and everything to go with it to just play and feel good that you just have to execute your responsibility. I feel like both guys might have had the feeling of, I have to do more than just my responsibility. I have to make this play that, you know, I know the high lows coming, 
and the high is behind me. But if I can go make the stop on the low, we get him in the third and long and we can get off the field because early in the season, they weren't getting off the field. Yeah. So, so you think they were pressing a little bit? I and think it, it's that, possible. That part took its toll. Yeah. It's hard to, it's hard to really say without being like in a meeting or whatever, like, what were you thinking in this moment? But I feel like that is part of it. Like they were kind of pressing because everything was failing around them. We should have them on. So you could say, what were you thinking? <laughs> <I'd>... <laughs> That's your job. You're, you're an... Pratt would give you a hell of an answer too. That would be a good one. <laughs> and that's your guy, but yeah, that would be a good one. It, run defense wise. It, who would you say coming into this year was better between the two? Ooh. Uh, I feel like Wilson would be more consistent, but Pratt would make more splash plays going into this year. That's what I thought. Got it. Okay. So as far as Wilson's concerned, what stood out and we know the defensive tackle stuff, we kind of led with the things that are going on around them, but, but how do you think he did specifically against the run? Because this run defense took a step back and it, it can't just be on the defensive tackles or Nick Scott or Dax Hill. I feel like he did all right. I, I don't know if either one of these guys are the guys that can do what, like a, you know, like a Roquan Smith can, can do in like, even if guys around them are failing, they still make the play. They know like the offensive line gets to me, just runs through them and still makes a tackle or whatever. It felt like when guys failed around them, they didn't have the ability to rise above that and still make the play. I do think Wilson was solid against the run, if I had to describe it. But I also felt like, I don't think Wilson's a bad athlete, but I do think teams took advantage once in a while of being able to throw swing passes and just stuff quick to the flat and outrun him to the corner. There were a couple of times this year where he looked slower than I remember. Did you notice a difference in athleticism from Wilson, even early year to late year or last year to this year? I don't know. I don't know if it's a difference because what, what sticks in my mind is Andy Reid kind of went after those swings and those flats in the red zone specifically. And I think it's actually why he gave up that touchdown on the angle route was because Andy Reid went after those swings and flats and make him work through traffic the yeah. past couple of years so then he kind of tries to cheat it and then they cheat it back where it's like well i'm not actually doing that i'm faking out going in as an easy touchdown yeah i i don't know if it's that specifically from year to year it looked different i feel like the processing speed might have been like just a hair slower on some of this stuff that's to me that's me thinking of that one crack toss play where there's jet motion the one way and he just never sees the toss i guess and isn't getting over the top to go make that play. Let's get to Jermaine Pratt. You have anything else on Logan before we, we get to Pratt, Jake, or are we good? Let's Looks like transition to Jermaine Pratt and talk about the future outlook as well. We can finish the show with a conversation about Pratt with a conversation about the outlook optimistic, optimistic or concerned about these contracts for the Cincinnati Bengals coming up next. Today's show is brought to you by FanDuel. Happy Super Bowl to all those who celebrate from FanDuel, America's number one sports book. I'm sure, well, not many of us in Cincinnati are celebrating the Super Bowl matchup, even though I think there's a, a clear and obvious team that you would root for. But we can get into that next week. But if you're like me, Super Bowl Sunday is all about scoring the best seat on the couch. And, well, not only will you grab awesome snacks, but you're also but you at least also can cuddle up with FanDuel and bet on who you think is going to win Super Bowl 58. FanDuel also has bets for which players will score a touchdown. That's prop bets, how many points will be scored, and so much more. I'm sure there might be a Taylor bet in there as well. New customers who join today get $200 in bonus bets if your first bet of $5 or more wins. That's right. So throw $5 on an NBA matchup tonight, and boom, you get $200 in bonus bets if you're First bet of $5 wins. All you have to do is go to FanDuel.com slash locked on to sign up. Again, that's FanDuel.com slash locked on. Make every moment more with FanDuel, an official sports partner of the NFL. Before we dive in to Jermaine Pratt, in fact, and this is a good way to transition between the two, but let's talk about some of the good. We've talked about what went wrong and, and some of the things they struggled with. But to close the loop on Logan Wilson and to start the conversation on Jermaine Pratt, what did each of those guys do well? You can talk about both of them individually, Mike. Okay. I thought Wilson 
was once again kind of a ball magnet, you know, got the four interceptions and that broke up nine passes. That's a heck of a year from ball production. I know that we talked about some of the touchdowns and the other stuff he was giving up that maybe the last couple of years he might break up, but let's still give him credit for making those plays on the ball. I mean, four interceptions, I think, is the same amount he had in 2021 when everyone was kind of going goo goo eyes over <laughs> his production on the ball. Um, and nine passes broken up is really nice. So I think that stood out. I think. Also, he, despite we talked about that athleticism thing, he's still a really good Tampa runner. And I think that stood out as well. Not that there was the one play to Firemuth, but that was a really tough play. And I feel like when you're looking for a linebacker that can do that, that's pretty awesome that you have one that can run the middle of the field. Pratt, I feel like, is still at times he could show up with his run throughs and being able to make plays that way. He actually uh, is probably, to me, the better man and match guy, and he has been the past couple of years, but that still shows up in a way of he can run with somebody up the field. I know it happened with Trey McBride in the Cardinals game on an over route, and Trey McBride's a pretty good athlete for a tight end. He's running with him step for step, and it's an incompletion. I think that he also read a couple screen passes and was able to trigger quickly on some things that were – that. Uh, made a tackle for a loss or made a stop at the line of scrimmage that otherwise would have been a solid gain for them. So I do think that when you look at their seasons overall, I talked about being uh, underwhelmed. I don't think it was like they were terrible. I just think it was a step down from them being really good. And they still showed that they have this really good talent in flashes. I just don't know if it was consistent. Yeah. And you're worried about them being able to overcome, which is, why when we talk about free agency over the next few months in the draft, whether it's defensive tackle, whether it's the communication in the secondary, heck, I, I think the secondary, they just need to be talking every single day, group chat, and, and heck, maybe they could join us every single day. We'll have a member of the secondary, and they can communicate and work on their communication. Um, Mike, as far as Pratt goes, uh, of course, Jake put it on me to bring up the negative. Let's start with run defense because you mentioned that he was probably – a little bit better in that area, I think. Um, what stood out specifically about this year when it comes to Jermaine Pratt and run defense? Uh, I feel like some of the run throughs that you have. So, a run through is instead of trying to go over the top and run with a guy laterally, you're going to run through the opening in the offensive line mm -hmm. and go try to make a play. They weren't successful this year for him very often. He had a couple. But last year, it felt like that was one of the biggest things was like, oh, goodness, Pratt read that perfectly, got a clean run through and made a TFL or made a stop or at least maybe you didn't make the tackle, didn't miss the tackle, forced him to force the back to stop and try to go to a hole that's not there. And they got tackled over there. That didn't happen so much this year. I felt like every time he was able to run through, the back was able to bounce outside of him. And now you've got less numbers on the outside trying to make that play. So that was the big thing for me that stood out in terms of not great run defense from him individually, just not making that play. Other than that, I mean, I don't know if either one of these guys are great at taking on blocks, but I think Pratt's a little bit worse at it. And that's also probably why he's choosing to run underneath and run through some of this instead of try to take him on. I do think that he can take on blocks, especially when they put him on the line of scrimmage and he knows what he's, what he has to do on this play is just, I've got to go slam my head into that guy and stop him from pushing me outward. I think he does a pretty good job at that. It's why when they get into that five, one front, he's one of the ends instead of just using an end over there, it kind of makes a more multiple two and coverage by doing that. But yeah, I think the run through is not being successful. was a big thing on why the run defense wasn't as good. Talked about tackling regression for Logan Wilson. Was that an issue for Jermaine Pratt as well? It looks like the PFF yeah. percentage for missed tackles is back in line with his career numbers, but had a really good year in 2022 as far as missed tackling went. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it was definitely a step down from last year at least, where I thought last year was his best year, like easily his best year. Mm -hmm. And he was really good last year. Talk about the missed tackles. I mean, that's one part – he broke up three passes this year. He broke up 10 last year and averaged under five yards of target last year, over six this year. And I know that's all coverage stuff, but I feel like everything kind of went the opposite way on him. The missed tackles definitely showed up. And there are times where he makes the tackle, but that 
I know sometimes we love the arm thing and he's wrestling guys. Sometimes the guy is getting like an extra three yards, two yards yeah. as he's trying to pull them down. And that's when you don't love the big bear arm, bear hug tackle. It, it goes both yeah. ways. The proclivity for Jermaine Pratt in particular, which leads, I think, some of the others on the team to play similarly to try to strip the ball late in the down. James, sorry, go ahead. You're good. All right, let, let's get to more positive rosy times uh in the rosy times could be next year where the super bowl is in new orleans and everyone's painted that picture already mike full disclosure on yesterday's show we discussed patrick mahomes and, and joe burrow and, and how joe burrow's the only guy in the afc that seems to be able to beat patrick mahomes on a consistent basis certainly in the playoffs he's the only guy in the league that has done it up to this point so let's keep it rosy with how logan wilson and jermaine pratt their outlook Maybe it's not Rosie. We didn't ask you this beforehand. I assume it is because they're both young enough and talented players. Do you think they can bounce back? Is it reasonable to expect those guys to either reach their 2021, 2022 level or take an even bigger step forward if they do find the right pieces and put the right pieces around them with the, the natural communication and things around them improving? Yeah, I think it's reasonable to expect that they get better next year. I think this was a whirlwind of... Uh, unfortunate events around them where the secondary is extremely young and they weren't working well together. Maybe they felt like they had to press a little bit. I think also we didn't talk much about it. I feel like having a Jesse Bates that can make plays outside of a normal safety's role or range also kind of helps you out. Uh, but that's gone and not probably not coming back next year. So I, th I think they should, I would expect them to be better next year. I do wonder a little bit about, can they reach back to the 2022 level, 2021? I think they're like, I personally, I feel like they're better players than they were in 2021. They just might not have played that way. Maybe that's just reading too much into 2022, but yeah, I think with the communication getting better and a little bit goes to the Bengals front office. If they can put the right pieces in front of them to keep them clean, to let them read the play out, to let them play free, that I think that will help a lot too. So some of it is putting my faith in the front office, knowing that they have an interior defensive line problem. And some of it's putting my faith in the communication getting better, but I do have more of a rosy outlook on these two. I think this was just a down year for them and they'll be able to bounce back. So you say rosy outlook, the Bengals have extended both these guys. Pratt has two more years left on his deal. Logan has three, I believe. Ooh, four right? is an extension on top of his deal. I, anyways, regardless, they're both under contract for multiple years. You think the Bengals made the right call in prioritizing both linebackers? For the price they got them, for sure. I think the only thing I think of is, would you rather have Jesse Bates than both linebackers? Mm -hmm. That's I, where I was getting at without saying it. You <laughs> said it. He's an all pro. <laughs> like that's, that's the thing. It's like, that's why I think like pay the blue chip guys because they're blue chip guys, but I, I don't think they regret paying them. And I think they got them both at a deal and look, they are both together cheaper than the deal Jesse Bates got. But would I have, if, if you could go back, would I maybe have paid? We're, we're late enough. Hopefully everybody's dropped out. Would I have paid Bates of the extra money and tried to figure out the linebacker duo elsewhere? Maybe. <laughs> look at how look at how Bates played. Like, no, you, you you think I'm gonna send people to this part of the pod? <laughs> Mike Sam says that Jesse Bates should have been paid and not the two linebackers. Uh, yeah, it is four it that. is four years for Logan Wilson. By the way, he's entering year one of that extension this year. He's under contract through 2027. Yeah, the, the salary cap number jump for Logan Wilson occurs in 2024. He's under contract through 2027. Jermaine Pratt, two more years on his deal, under contract through 2025. His cap number has already increased because he re-signed. It was not an extension. So next year, starting in 2024, the cap number for the Bengals starting linebackers jumps from about $8 million, uh, about $9 million rather, to about $14 million. So a bit of a, a, bit of a jump in salary cap expenditure at linebacker. But the salary cap, of course, goes up as well. I think, to me, the summary seems to be that they've got some above-average players who may or may not be able to elevate their game too much or a little bit reliant on the conditions around them, which is, I think, fairly normal for a linebacker. You talked about that applying to Ray Lewis as well with the Ravens, who has uh, uh, universally agreed to be a Hall of Fame-level linebacker and one of the better to do it in NFL history. 
so this is a position that is dependent on their surroundings. But even with that, they regressed a little bit last year. And you could potentially get some positive regression back toward the mean, right? Back toward somewhere between 22 and 21, perhaps, or, or 22 and 23, perhaps, where they're probably still above average players who would benefit from a little bit more experience in the secondary and a little bit more depth and a little bit more talent on the interior defensive line in front of them, especially as the league shifts and seems to be getting more 12 personnel heavy. We'll see. Maybe we'll see three linebackers a little bit more on the field for the Bengals next year. Maybe they'll continue to match out with five defensive linemen. I think that's more likely, but is that a, a fair summary uh, of the outlook going forward, Mike? Yeah. Above average players that are a victim of their surroundings is kind of how I would describe what happened in the season, even if individually they both yeah. played under expectations. As the linebacker position goes for more on the linebackers, check out the description. We've got a link to Mike's full article over at allbengals.com has a bunch of clips in there as well. If you're curious about examples of plays, you can check out the full piece again on allbengals.com with that full analysis until next time, Bengals fans. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Locked On Bengals podcast. Who day and have a good one.